When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and today we are on our second installment of the Atonement Trilogy. Last week was Gethsemane, this week is Calvary, and next week is the Garden Tomb. And so to go from atonement to crucifixion to resurrection, like I said last week, all of those fall under the broad umbrella of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And two out of three isn't good enough, and one out of three certainly isn't sufficient. We have to be able to understand and embrace all three aspects of this. And today's is probably the hardest, especially for Latter-day Saints, to wrap their hearts around. Because today is... Today's hard. Today is painful, physical, spiritual. The suffering that we'll have to study today is intense. Uh, the word excruciating literally means out of the cross. Can you hear cross in the middle of that term? Excruciating? Uh, I, I'm going to do my best to avoid being too graphic. But in some ways, there's no way to get around the agonizing ordeal that Jesus is going to experience in what we study today. Now, perhaps it's because of that graphicness, because perhaps it's because of the just the visceral pain that is being portrayed here that makes us shy away from today's topic. Uh, and we rush back to the shadows of Gethsemane to spend the bulk of our time and attention there. Uh, perhaps part of this is a, an overcorrection from a, um, a misunderstanding that's had in in traditional Christianity. And I, I've said this a million times, and this is why I talk about proving contraries all the time and being, staying in the Goldilocks zone, that an overcorrection is in some ways no, no better than the problem that you were trying to correct. The challenge of life is to correct without overcorrecting. Uh, whichever direction you happen to be swinging from and to, it's to keep that pendulum in the middle. It's to stay in the, in the, in the Goldilocks zone and balance things. And traditional Christianity has emphasized the crucifixion and underemphasized Gethsemane. Now, part of it is because it's so it's so misunderstood. Well, as we studied last week, there's it, we're dim witnesses, as we quoted Farrar. It, it's we don't completely understand based on the accounts all that took place there. It will require Paul's theologizing. For Latter Day Saints, the Book of Mormon is our greatest help to understand better what took place there. But if it's traditional Christianity's challenge to, to recognize the power of Gethsemane, then it's the Latter-day Saints' challenge to recognize the absolutely essential nature of Calvary. Uh, that with Remember what Joseph Smith once said about baptism and confirmation? That if you have one without the other, it doesn't count? He said you might as well baptize a bag of sand if you're not going to get confirmed because the baptism of water is woefully incomplete without baptism of spirit. Well, in a similar way, Gethsemane without Calvary is insufficient, just like Calvary without Gethsemane is incomplete. And so we're going to need to do our best to, to navigate all three elements of this, of this atoning trilogy. Gethsemane, Calvary, and Garden Tomb are all equally important in all of this. A good friend, John Hilton, published a book recently called Considering the Cross, an excellent study. Uh, he spent so much work on just trying to plumb the depths of why don't we talk about Calvary more? What is it about our history or our, our focus that has kept us from fully embracing the cross in terms of, not, not in terms of a, a symbol or an icon, but rather, one of the key parts of human history, uh, one of the climactic moments in the entire plan of salvation. And so to, I mean, in fact, in the Book of Mormon, over and over and over, it's, it mentions the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ uh, and puts those two together that it's through the sufferings and death that we might be saved. 
And if we associate, uh, this is an overgeneralization, but if we associate sufferings with, Geth with Gethsemane and death with Calvary, of course there was suffering on, Cal on Calvary. We'll see all of that today as well. But to, to use those two terms to bring in those two places and fuse them as one, there was a night that passed in between, but Jesus was awake for it all. It was one long, brutal day and night and day of darkness. In some ways, it was the opposite of the sign given the Nephites for Jesus' birth. This, this was as, as hard a, a set of hours as you could possibly imagine. It goes beyond what we could imagine because we're mere mortals. And so I pray that the Holy Ghost may help expand our understanding and deepen our appreciation and strengthen our faith for what took place in all three of these places. Last week's experience studying Gethsemane, I pray, was a blessing to you. It was to me. I know I was on sacred ground, and, and I pray that the Spirit conveyed the sacredness of those moments. And I, I pray that even though today it is, is difficult, I hope that the Holy Ghost will soften our hearts to the point that truth can reach us through the pain of what we'll be discussing. Pray for that, please. I am too. Now, to put all of this in perspective, can we start with a verse from the Book of Mormon? Last week, we actually started with one from Jacob chapter 1, uh, to, that all that we're learning and all that we're discussing is not only for our sake, but for Christ's sake as well, which is interesting. Uh, what, are we, what are we doing with what we learn that would benefit the Savior, since everything he did was meant to benefit us? Well, there's another verse in Jacob chapter 1 that I want to start today's discussion with. And it's a verse that is near and dear to my heart because it's the very first verse in my life that I spent an entire hour studying without being able to move on to the next verse. And I finished after the hour, not because I was done with the verse, but because I had something I had to get to. Uh, and I moved on, and the next day I came back to this same verse. This happened my freshman year of college many, many moons ago. And my professor had said to us, there will be some days, this, the, the assignment there was study the, the script of the Book of Mormon, it was a Book of Mormon class, intensely study it at least half an hour a day. And he pointed out to us, there will be some days you spend the entire half an hour on a single verse. And I laughed thinking, I'm a slow reader, but nobody's that slow. Well, this verse, Jacob chapter 1 verse 8, was the first verse that I spent more than the full half an hour on. I just, it wouldn't put me down. Uh, and to ponder every phrase, to examine the language, to think hard about what Jacob was trying to convey here. Here's the verse, Jacob 1 verse 8, Wherefore we would to God that we could persuade all men not to rebel against God. This is Jacob, remember, uh, talk about being very closely associated with those who had rebelled against God. Big brothers, Laman and Lemuel, family splitting over these things, wars between cousins and brothers and sisters. To understand the, the challenge of rebellion, and that's what he's trying to put an end to. He goes on, not only to persuade all men not to rebel against God, but not to provoke him to anger. And if those are the negatives he's trying to overcome, here are the positives that would make that possible. But that all men would believe in Christ and view his death and suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world. Wherefore, so with those purposes in mind, I, Jacob, take it upon me to fulfill the commandment of my brother Nephi. And what was that commandment? It was to teach of Christ and preach of Christ and write according to his prophecies so that their children would know to what source they must look for a remission of their sins. Now that source is Christ and we will see him today. But what Jacob is trying to help us see, hope that we'll see, is the death of Christ. Think about that phrase. It's one thing to believe in Christ, which was his first hope. But to do so, to get to that point by viewing his death and suffering his cross and bearing the shame of the world, those were the phrases that picked me up and wouldn't put me down. And the more I thought about that, what effect would it have on us to view the death of Jesus? 
Is that one of the reasons Jesus was pleading with his closest apostles to watch with me this hour? If you do, you will see things that will forever change you. And so my prayer today is that we will view the death of Christ in such a way that we will be encouraged and supported and motivated, strengthened to be able to bear whatever crosses we have to, to to be able to overcome the shame of the world and not care about it. They can do whatever they want in the great and spacious building. I'm staying right here at the tree of life. And so much of that spiritual strength comes when we can be active, intentional witnesses. Spectators doesn't do justice to it. This is more of an intentional watching. Remember that, that word we saw last week, that, that attentiveness, that alertness, that focus, that hypervigilance that we are watchmen on the tower. And what we're looking down the tower to see is the, the Father's suffering servant, His suffering Son. And so to see through the shadows of Gethsemane, to see beneath the gathering storm clouds there on Calvary, to be able to witness what Jesus went through for us is meant to be life-changing. Now, one other powerful experience I had with Jacob chapter 1 verse 8, and then we'll jump into Matthew 27 and Mark 15 and Luke 23 and John 19. We have so much incredible material to, to sift through and understand this week. But this came when... The Passion of the Christ, the movie by Mel Gibson first came out years ago. I was a young seminary teacher, and it was controversial. If you remember back in those days, it was controversial for several reasons. One was a concern over Gibson's portrayal of the death of Christ. They had that Passion Week, and feeling like it might come across as anti-Semitic, to to place the blame at the feet of, of ancient Judaism. Yeah, and, there was a, and that's a legitimate concern. We cannot allow uh, things to take us in that direction. But among a Latter-day Saint audience, the, the challenge was, this is a movie about Jesus. I mean, if there's anything worth watching, it's that, right? On the other hand, this is an R-rated movie, and there are concerns about inappropriateness. Now, the specific form of inappropriateness there would be violence. And to do a... And to do an accurate job of portraying the Savior's last hours, it would be an R-rated movie. Uh, There's no way around that if you choose to portray it all. Now, that's a big if. Do you choose to? Last week I I talked about in most of the videos that I've seen from the church, the church's uh, perspective, they leave a lot to the imagination. And it's kind that they do so. Uh, But the interesting thing about the, the movie. I had student after student after student ask me my thoughts about whether I thought they should see it or not. And what's your take on, on that <laughs> R-rated on the one hand, but the, the life of Christ on the other? Part of my concern, by the way, grew out of section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants. We read that verse last week where it says that Jesus, the, God, the greatest of all, God himself, even Jesus, the greatest of all, suffered both body and spirit. Now, it's really hard to show spiritual suffering on the big screen. How do you film that? And so, perhaps one thing that Mel Gibson did to try to compensate for an inability to show spiritual suffering, especially if you don't understand the realities of Gethsemane, uh, and that seemed, in their minds, seems to be more of a Oh, just the, the human shudder of the, the soul, uh, worrying about what's about to take place the next day in Calvary. That's the real intense moment. So this was just oh, preparation and intimidation on the Savior's part. If you don't understand the spiritual realities of Gethsemane and the spiritual components of Calvary, then what are you left with? Well, you're left with the physical agonies alone. And that is something that Hollywood can portray. And boy, can they portray it. And so uh, that was another aspect of concern. Not that this is gratuitous violence, but 
is it coming in a way to overcompensate for an inability to portray the spiritual depth of what Jesus was enduring? Now, full disclosure, I chose not to see Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. I chose, well, I'll say this, in class, as I was trying to honor agency, uh, but also try to clarify my position since my students were asking for it, I shared that verse from Jacob chapter 1, verse 8, that even then I was trying to prove contraries even before I understood the concept, but trying to help my students understand the value of viewing the death of Christ. And we talked about that verse and why Jacob would be so intense or so intent, I should say, on persuading people. You've got to see this. And then my students were like, oh, so we should go see this movie? I said, that's not what I said. Don't forget the time period. When did Jacob live? There were no movie theaters to attend for him. In fact, the irony here is Jacob was a BC saint. So how are you going to view the death of Christ when it hasn't even happened yet? Are we back to Abinadi's words of speaking of things to come as though they already had come? Seems like it. But for Jacob, this must have been a more spiritual experience and a spiritual sight that allowed him to view the death of Jesus. There, this is what I said to my students. There is value in viewing the death of Christ. There is a deep, significant, powerful spiritual transformation that comes when you watch with him. But there is a price to be paid to view that death. A price that Jacob was more than willing to pay and that he was trying to persuade all of us to pay as well. But if you think that price is a $10 movie ticket, then you're missing something here. So to my students then and to my fellow students now, yes, may we view the death of Christ. But may we do it in a way that that we're, they're, that we're paying the necessary price of admission. Alertness, attentiveness, spiritual sight, spiritual strength, watching with him to view what he's doing for us. Please keep that in mind in all that we'll study this week. Where to begin? Like I said, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all weighing in. Now, they had their different agendas and different approaches and different focal points through most of Christ's ministry. But when it came to his final week, they were riveted, all four, making sure that we would be riveted upon these things as well. We're going to start with Christ's trial before Pilate. We saw his mock trials before Jewish authorities, and keep authorities in quotes. Uh, we saw that last week with Annas and Caiaphas. Uh, the camera now shifts from, from Judaism to, to Rome. And Jewish authorities that didn't have much authority to a Roman governor who had plenty. Uh, Pilate is running the show in Palestine. And for the Jews to send Jesus to him. Remember their intent? And the book of John clarifies this far earlier than Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. That Jesus knew that death was on the, the minds of the Jewish authorities. And he's calling them out for it. Now, there's a challenge there for them. Uh, stoning was their preferred method of execution, uh, but they wanted Jesus crucified, and they did not have the authority to make that happen, but they knew Rome did. So how do we arrest Jesus on Jewish charges and then change those charges to something that Rome would be concerned about? Remember, we talked about this bait and switch last week that, they did, uh, that Caiaphas and Annas were doing? But they're going to do a bigger one when it comes to passing the, the baton, or passing the buck, really, to, to Pilate. Because if the Jewish concern was blasphemy, Rome doesn't care about that. It's like, oh, this is some provincial folk religion. We don't care. Yeah. Say whatever you want against your quote-unquote gods. But when it comes to political treason, oh yeah, that's going to perk up the Roman ear. And, and concern them intensely. We are trying to keep the, the peace, the Pax Romana, and the last thing we want is some kind of Jewish insurrection from some so-called Messiah figure. So some military Messiah. 
well, that wasn't Jesus. But if the Jewish authorities could convince Pilate that that is what Jesus was after, then now this becomes a problem for Rome. And it will be Rome's problem to take care of. That's the plan from the get-go. And so here we are. It is now Friday morning. The wee hours. Uh, the, the, the mock trials among the Jewish leaders were in the middle of the night. And again, outside the, the sight of, of witnesses that would know that this quote-unquote trial was a travesty. And there was no justice being honored there. But then they get rid of, they pass the buck. They pass Jesus on to Roman authorities. And here we'll start with the Matthew account. This is chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. When the morning was come, oh, and it had been a long time in coming. Jesus had already made it through that sleepless night. The spiritual high and the emotional taxation of the Lord's Supper. The fervency and focus of the intercessory prayer. I think about the intensity of Gethsemane, all of that exceeding sorrow, the sore amazement that we talked about last week, the strengthening angel, the great drops of blood, then the mockery of a sham trial, the slapping, the smiting, the spitting, all the physical agony, the blood loss, the emotional trauma, betrayal, and doubt, and denial from those closest to him, the spiritual weight of eternity weighing on his shoulders. Yeah, the morning was come. Oh, there's a lot behind that phrase. But with the coming of day, notice what happens next. All the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Mark says that they held a consultation. Oh, let's just have a little consult, shall we? Oh, a consultation over condemnation, over execution. That's what they're after. I mean, it makes it sound so prim and proper. But this is a conspiracy, and everyone seems to be in on it. All the chief priests, the elders, and their plan is to have Jesus crucified. Now, when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Talk about an irony there. That the Jewish authorities thought it necessary to bind Jesus? Oh, no, he was already bound. Bound and determined. Bound by his word and his will, to keep every one of his premortal promises. I'm not looking for an easy way out. I'm not trying to escape from this, believe me. So last night when Judas came with his army, there's overcompensation for his own lack of power by bringing the power of Roman rule. Jewish authorities, you're doing the same thing. You think you have to bind me. You don't. I will, I'll gladly go to Pilate if it means that I'll eventually get to ascend the cross and return to my Father in heaven. Well, in verse 28 through 30, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So again, this straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. I mean, we, we certainly can't do this on the Sabbath day. We don't want to do that. Let's get this done early. We don't want to go into the hall of judgment because, oh, being in Roman territory. No, I can have the Romans do our dirty work and have them crucify Christ. But far be it from us to cross the threshold and go be defiled on, on Roman ground. Well, they having come this close, Pilate had to come the rest of the way. So Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Makes you wonder if he's used to this. Like, oh, these, these Jewish leaders that are so concerned about ritual purity, I always got to come out in their direction so they don't have to come all the way into mine. And they're always bringing trumped up charges trying to get me to take care of oh, the, the, the problem people that they can't seem to handle. Well, who's this one? And what's the accusation this time? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. And that's an interesting answer, because it's no answer at all. Pilate is demanding, what's the accusation? I mean, forget Miranda writes where the, the person that's being accused should know what the accusation is. We're not, gonna, we're not to that point of justice yet. But as far as the judge is concerned... Yeah, you'd think the judge ought to know what the accusation is. What am I trying this person for? And the Jews have no response. 
It's as if they recognize the flimsiness of their reasons, that they have no reasons at all. And so they don't give any. They just say, well, uh, the fact he's here should tell you he's done something, done something wrong. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, and we want you to put the fire out by extinguishing him. But smoke? No, this is just smoke and mirrors. They're doing whatever they can to trump up charges, to make Jesus look like the enemy that needs to be overcome. But here, knowing that Pilate would see through all of that, they have no response. Well, that's only going to last so long before Pilate's like, no, seriously. You, you, you don't just bring somebody and say, well, we brought them so that thus that they must be guilty and therefore you should go and execute them. No, give me some kind of reason. And in the Luke account, we see it. Chapter 23, verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation. Notice it's the nation. Uh, it's Rome. It's not our religion. It's not Judaism. They're switching things from blasphemy to treason. They specifically accuse him of this, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king, which is not just ironic, it's downright deceptive. Forbidding to give tribute to Caesar? This is the same Jesus who said, render unto Caesar that which belongeth to Caesar. If it's his image and superscription on the coin, then I guess it belongs to him. Talk about trumped up lies. Forbidding to give tribute to Caesar? That's not, but, but then again, was Pilate there present in the temple when Jesus told that? No. So as long as we can keep, and we already brought false witnesses on our side to try to condemn Jesus in the Jewish court. Well, let's just make sure there are no witnesses for the defense when Jesus is arraigned before Pilate. So yes, he said he was Christ, a king. And we're not going to talk about all the things that he said about, that's not my kind of kingdom. And I'm not a military messiah. And I'm not here to free you from Rome. I'm here to save you from sin. We're not going to include any of that. It will be a half-truth. He said he was Christ a king. And then we'll let Pilate fill in the blanks. It reminds me so much of those who attack religion, attack faith. Anti-Mormonism is so prone to this that we're going to use a half-truth or we're going to decontextualize information and we'll throw something out there in hopes that people don't get past the surface level. And if they can respond emotionally to the shock and awe of some kind of decontextualized quote-unquote history, then, oh, they'll just Two, plus two and two equals four, and they see the smoke, so they assume the fire, it's completely unfair. And that's what they're doing against Jesus. Now, Pilate seems to see through that at first. At least in the John version, chapter 18, verse 31, then said Pilate unto them, take ye him. I don't want to deal with this. You do it. Take ye him and judge him according to your law. You see, he's already starting to wash his hands, which is what he's going to try to do from start to finish with all of this. He recognizes this is a religious problem from the start. So if he's broken your laws and took too many steps on the Sabbath or, or healed somebody on a day that he wasn't, wasn't supposed to do such work, ah, that's a Jewish problem. So can you please deal with it? Why do you think we allow a Jewish Sanhedrin to still operate? Now, the Jews therefore said unto him, Oh, no, 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 no. It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, which makes it crystal clear what they're after. We are seeking capital punishment. And, so you, and since you won't let us do that, then you've got to do it yourself. Okay? So kill this man. Now, John interrupts the narrative and says that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. You see, when Jesus began to clearly prophesy to his apostles, I will go to Jerusalem, I will be betrayed, I will be lifted up on the cross, I'll be killed, crucified. That's not a Jewish form of capital punishment. That's a Roman form. And so, yes, it has to shift from Sanhedrin to Pilate's palace. You have to go from, from Jewish authorities to Roman ones. And Jesus is moving in that direction. Now, with that talk of capital punishment, that does perk up Pilate's ears realizes, okay, then perhaps this is my jurisdiction and I can't completely wash my hands of it. So what am I going to do? Pilate entered into the judgment hall again 
and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Pilate asking Jesus that same question. And what an irony to picture this, a Roman governor standing face to face with a Jewish tradesman, a craftsman, a carpenter, an itinerant preacher of sorts, a doer of good deeds, a sayer of wise sayings, a storyteller. And there they are face to face with a question of authority. So which one of us wears the crown? Jesus. Can you picture Pilate wondering? Now, verse 34, Jesus answered, and he said to him, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? And Pilate answered, probably frustrated, Am I a Jew? It's like, I don't care about this, okay? I, I want this to remain a Jewish problem. I don't have a dog in this fight. So why are you asking me? He said, Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? So again, Pilate is trying to wrest some kind of reason out of somebody. And if the Jewish authorities won't really give me something. I mean, they said something vague about you being a king. In fact, a king. Think about the indefinite article used in that Luke account. Some kind of king. I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, what kind of crown do you wear? Please just help me understand why you're standing in front of me and why we're having this conversation. There's all kinds of other things I'd rather be doing right now. Okay? With my royal time. Now, the interesting thing about what Jesus had said to him, though, that maybe got Pilate a little flustered, is that first phrase, are you saying these things of yourself or simply because somebody else has said this about me to you? What Jesus is asking here is, are these really your questions and concerns, Pilate? Or do they belong to someone else and you've just inherited them? That's a question I often ask my conversation partners when somebody is deep in faith crisis, especially if they're angry and kind of demanding answers to questions. Well, if they have questions, awesome. I love questions. I try to honor questions every time. It's the, it's the James 1.5 in me. If you lack wisdom, then please let him ask. I'm not here to upbraid. I'm here to give liberally. But it's interesting that sometimes you get a sense as you're talking with people that sometimes they don't even fully understand the question that they're asking. Or sometimes the question is so obscure that you're like, wait, where did you get this question? I've shared this with, with some of you before, but on my mission, it was the first experience I really had with this. A wonderful Seventh-day Adventist man who ran the Seventh-day Adventist church for the West Coast of Puerto Rico. And he was really open, a younger couple, awesome guy. And, and he was letting us teach him. So we're like, oh, this would be amazing. He joins the church and then all these Adventists follow. Well, how's that for, for a 19-year-old faith, right? Well, at one point, we thought he was progressing. We thought he was sincere. We thought we were making progress with him. And at one point, he said, no, no, wait a minute. You know, I was thinking the other day, I had a quick question for you. Joseph Smith said that there was no Greek on the gold plates. Uh, Reformed Egyptian, right? Isn't that what he, what he said? Uh, and yet, there's words like baptism all over the Book of Mormon. And that's a Greek term. So how does a word like baptism appear in the Book of Mormon if there was no Greek on the plates? And I sat there, just kind of deer with the headlights in my eyes, like, uh, we didn't cover this in the MTC. I had never heard of that quote from Joseph Smith, and I didn't know that baptism was a Greek word originally. So I'm sitting there, uh, 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 what do I say? Well, open your mouth and it should be filled. That's how I lived my life. So I opened it, hoping it wouldn't be filled with my foot. And I said, you know, those are interesting questions. I'm not totally familiar with the question or the answer, but let's think this thing through. The fact that I didn't know that, that baptism was a Greek word, it, it lets you know that it's an English word as far as I'm concerned, whatever its roots might be. And what, if, if I were to say to you, and, and let's use some circumlocution. I have to do this all the time with my Spanish. If I don't know a vocabulary word, I try to use the vocabulary I do have to describe the thing and then hope that you have a word for it that you recognize, right? Isn't that how a kind of language and translation works? If I were to describe to you a ritual immersion in water 
in order to wash away sins and join a religious community, what would you call that? Wouldn't that be in Spanish bautizar or bautismo? In English, it would be baptism or baptize. I don't know what the word is in Greek. I certainly don't know what the word is in Reformed Egyptian. But whatever word Mormon used to describe a ritual immersion in water for the washing away of sins and joining of a religious community. Joseph Smith would have seen that on the plates and gone, oh, wait, what? Oh, you mean like a baptism? And you picture Mormon shrugging his shoulders like, I don't, if that's what you call it, then yeah, we call it something different in Reformed Egyptian. But if that's your term, then run with it. You don't have to know Greek or Reformed Egyptian to know what a baptism is. It's fully an English word for me as far as I'm concerned. Does that make sense? And he was like, ah, I suppose. But then it struck me. And this was one of those eye-opening experiences that I think prepared me for countless similar experiences later in my life. Because it dawned on me, wait a minute. And I said this to him, do, do you, am I supposed to believe that you were sincerely seeking a testimony of truth? And in your sincere uh, study of the Book of Mormon, you stumbled across a word baptism. And in your incredible Greek knowledge, you realize, oh, that's a Greek term. And then somehow, simultaneously, you were sincerely seeking truth by studying well, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Is, is, do you have that book? Uh, and you stumbled across this obscure statement where he said that there was no Greek upon the gold plates. And in your infinite wisdom, you, I didn't say that to him, I'm kind of being snarky here. But, uh, and then you put two and two together and you thought, wait a minute, how could this be the case? And I just looked at this good brother and said to him, is this really your question? Is this real interest and confusion and curiosity or is there something else going on here? And sheepishly, he admitted, uh, you caught me. We have these books that are like questions to use to stump the Mormon missionaries. And I thought that'd be a good one. Ah, I see. Well, thank you for finally admitting that. That lets us know that your seeking is not sincere. You, this was not curiosity. This was contention. Uh, so I guess we'll have to agree to disagree and part ways amicably and, and wish you the best. There is something powerful about Jesus' question to Pilate. And it's one that I think if we can do it non-confrontationally, we, we might need to bring that up with our conversation partners too. Honor their sincere seeking. Let them ask whatever question they might have. But in a gentle way, Try to come to understand whether or not this is their actual question. Because if there's one thing I've seen in all of the podcasts and videos and, and things that, that tend to tr trip people up in their faith, is they provide a laundry list of concerns and questions to ask. And what about this? What about that? And it's so decontextualized. It's so, well, I mean, there's, like I said before, there's smoke, there must be fire. And so what about this? And what about that? And just throw these things out in a very shallow kind of way in hopes that some of those questions will stick. And people will not really seek answers because I got what I wanted. I have a question. And with that question, I can use it almost as a shield to keep you at bay with whatever answers you think you might have. Have you ever sensed that, that they don't want your answers? They're not really listening to them? They don't want your answers because they have their questions. And ironically, they weren't their questions at all. To quote from Jesus to Pilate, they're not saying these things of themselves. They're just bringing things up that others have told them. <laughs> I, I had that breakthrough with a with one particular conversation partner. And when he, it finally dawned on him, like, wait a minute, yeah, I'm kind of being used by these anti-Mormons. I'm the puppet on their string. And they're like, ask this and ask that. And what about this? And what about that? And it's just this smoke screen. And, and we kind of laughed at the end of the conversation. I was like, are any of those questions really yours? And he's like, no, I, I didn't even understand half of them. Uh, 
there are answers to, to them. If, you'll, if, you, if they really are your questions, you'll be able to find the answers. It's because of that that I've often ended conversations like that with this question. Are you asking questions because you want answers? Or are you asking questions because you want me to have questions? If it's the first, I can do this all day. If it's the second, we're done. And for pilot, mm, where are you getting these kinds of questions? Be, please have the intellectual honesty to at least make sure they're things that you really wonder and you're willing to pay a price to come to an understanding of their answers. Well, in verse 36 and 37, the story continues. Jesus answers. And so whether or not this is your question or somebody else's, I'll actually answer this one as far as what kind of a king am I? My kingdom is not of this world. Think about how many times he said that in his farewell discourse in John, the, the, the sermon after supper, that I'm not of the world, and I pray that my, my followers will not be of the world either. My kingdom it, it is not an earthly one. It's not a military messiahship I'm trying to set up. You're safe, Pilate. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. I mean, we actually had a, a little mini insurrection start last night when one of my closest followers uh, attacked a man, cut off his ear, but I immediately healed it. I'm not that kind of king. You, you would know if I were, because there are disciples and, and followers, especially now that they're all here in town for Passover. The Jewish leaders were the ones that were so concerned about any kind of riot because the Romans would come and, and quash that whole thing. Oh, if we wanted to riot, now would be a good time to do it. If we wanted to fight, oh, sure. I could not only uh, alert my troops, my followers, but I could bring down 12 legions of angels, and that would take care of the Roman legions anytime. But no, my kingdom's not that kind of kingdom. He says, now is my kingdom not from hence. But the fact that he talked about a kingdom and my kingdom confused Pilate a bit. So he asks him, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? That's the word that pricked up his ears. And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. In the Matthew version, it's simply, Thou sayest. And the JST of Matthew, Thou sayest truly, for thus it is written of me. In the JST of the Mark account, by the way, he says, I am, even as thou sayest. And whenever you get that, I am, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's, he's admitting something here. Continuing in the John version, he adds, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. So I was born to be a king. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, Gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Isn't that what we sing at Christmas time? Well, Christmas was 33 years ago. But now that it's Easter, the crown remains. For this purpose I came into the world. And for this purpose I'm here before you. For this purpose I will head to the cross. For this purpose, I will rise again. And my otherworldly kingdom will eventually become the kingdom of God on earth. We're just not there quite yet. Now, this is an incredible conversation taking place. To which Jesus adds one other element. When he says, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, it wasn't just to set up a kingdom. Notice what he says next, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that's kind of what I'm after when I asked you about your asking, <laughs> when I questioned your questions, if they were yours or somebody else's. Are you really seeking truth? Because the way, the truth, and the life is standing before you. If you want to know 
the reality, then listen to my voice because my voice is truth. My voice is spirit. And it will resonate with yours if you're open to it. Now that puts the ball in Pilate's court. Do you have ears to hear? If so, then please hear. But Pilate's confused. In verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now think about those two statements. The first to Jesus and the second to Jesus' accusers. The first, what is truth? You say that you are here to bear witness of the truth. More than bear witness, to embody it as the truth personified. Yeah, but what, what is truth anyway? A beautiful hymn in our hymn book, Oh, say what is truth. And then verse after verse are incredible answers. That is a song worth singing. But Pilate leaves us with just the opening line. What is truth? It would be hard to say if he were a, a relativist, like those that surround us in our day. But it is a common question in the modern context. Well, what is truth? And whose truth is it? Your truth may be different from mine. And we hear this all the, t all the time. In our day, it's this call to authenticity, which always makes me wonder, okay, you want to be authentic? Fantastic. Which identity do you want to be authentic to? Since you have so many to choose from. Spiritual man, natural man. I'm authentically both but I'm trying to live up to the better angels of my nature. That My truth? Oh no, what about the truth? With a capital T. But we live in a day that won't touch that. We live in a day of such relativism that you do you and be authentic to it and live your truth. Have you heard that phrase? It's really common, especially among, especially among the rising generation. And I'm just, I'm just here to live my truth. And my truth, as if we could possess it, in fact, as if we could change it to meet whatever we want it to be, oh, it's an interesting age we live in. And we have pilots aplenty asking that question, ah, oh, what is truth? As if to say, there is no answer. Or, on the other hand, it's every answer. It's any answer. And truth is anything you want it to be. That's not how Jesus approaches this. For him, truth is truth, and he is that truth. And there's no other way or name or truth under heaven whereby we can be saved. Now, is that starting to sink in to Pilate's soul? Is he recognizing something here? You're right, those weren't my questions, but your answers are starting to become mine. And if your kingdom is not of this world, your place, you're the king of truth, not some kind of political opponent, then I think we're done here. And he tells the false accusers that your accusation is false. Uh, maybe you mis misinterpreted some things. And in your legalism and your literalism, we saw that problem so many times, right, earlier in the Gospels, that they took everything so literally that the thought of, oh, Jesus is a king, you're taking it in a political vein, in a literal way? No, 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 that's not the type. So, he is not guilty, I find no fault in him at all. Now, right then, the story could end. And Jesus is released, and the Jewish leaders are back to the drawing board and trying to figure out, well, that didn't work. How are we going to trump up other charges and get rid of him once and for all? I mean, it wouldn't end the story uh, completely. But at least it would pause it to the point that Pilate washes his hands and Jesus goes in the opposite direction. Not towards Calvary, but away from it. Because he's innocent. And the governor of Judea has established that fact. So that begs the question. Why didn't Pilate end it right then? Turn to the Mark account. And in chapter 15, verse 3 through 5, the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. So Jesus is not even going to dignify those false accusations with any kind of response. He just takes it all, suffering in silence. And Pilate asked him again, 
saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But no, Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now, this really takes him aback. Why wouldn't he try to defend himself? Talk about courage under pressure. Talk about just being unflappable under fire. And just, no, none of those, none of those things move me. Even when capital punishment is being weighed in the balance. Now, by the way, Elder Robert D. Hales gave an amazing talk called Christian Courage. It's one I read and reread almost every time in preparation for some kind of uh, interfaith dialogue or a conversation with someone that I have a feeling will probably attack me. It's, an, it's a masterful discourse. And in it, he talks about being, having the courage to stand up for your convictions, but to always do it in a Christ-like way. Convicted civility is how an evangelical leader once called it. But for uh, Elder Hales, have Christian courage. And Jesus, of course, had both. But in the talk, Elder Hales also says, there's not one-size-fits-all approaches. There's not a singular way to respond when you're attacked. Sometimes you defend yourself. Sometimes you say nothing. And Jesus is an example of all of those approaches. You have to have the Holy Ghost to let you know which one to follow in any given time. And this time, Jesus' silence leaves Pilate speechless, too. He marvels over this. You get the same sense in the Matthew version, chapter 27, verse 13 and 14. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? I mean, don't all of these accusations faze you at all? And Jesus answered him to never a word. Wow. Insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Yeah, there's this calm confidence. It comes from someone who knows he is innocent. In the Luke version, chapter 23, verse 4, Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. So, <laughs> hit the gavel. Case closed. Court adjourned. There's no reason to go forward. And yet, they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now, he stirreth up the people? No, 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 no. You are. You're the ones that are trying to stir everyone up. Turn this into some kind of rebellion so that its supposed leader ends up being crucified. Oh, talk about the pot calling the kettle black and them being guilty of the very things they're accusing Jesus of being guilty of. Stirring up the people. Now, notice what they said, though. He's been teaching it everywhere, not just here in Jewry, Judea. But he started this whole thing up in Galilee, and it's been spreading ever since. Now, next verse. When Pilate heard of Galilee, oh, that really per perked up his ears. He asked whether the man were a Galilean. And the reason he's so oh, curious all of a sudden is because Pilate sees a way out. Remember, he's trying to wash his hands of the whole thing from the very beginning. And the moment he hears Galilee, he thinks, ooh, jurisdiction. I'm the Roman governor here in Judea. But if he's a Galilean, then, oh, okay, this is outside of my, of my realm of responsibility. Somebody else is in charge of Galilee, and it's not me. So great, I can get out of this. Verse 7 and 8. As soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. How convenient, right? I mean, this is the Passover festival. So everybody comes in, even oh, Jews of, of questionable commitment like Herod. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Now, this scene only occurs in the Luke version. I'm so glad he remembered, though, enough to include it. Because this is Herod Antipas. We've got all kinds of Herods, right? There was Herod the Great that tried to kill Jesus as, as a baby. And then the kingdom is split up among his sons and their tetrarchs in different parts of the area. Well, Herod Antipas is up north in Galilee. That's his responsibility, his jurisdiction. And so this is a win-win for both of them. 
For Pilate, it's like, hey, wash the hands and pass the buck, and Herod's gonna, gonna weigh in on you. And Herod's like, sweet, I finally get to meet this guy. Now, this is the same Herod Antipas that had John the Baptist beheaded. This is the same Herod that was so concerned when he heard stories about Jesus. And is this John the Baptist back from the dead? Am I going to have to behead someone else and just end this thing once and for all? Do we need to have another dance party with Herodias and her daughter? But there's this curiosity behind Herod. And again, that suggests that he's not a sincere seeker of truth any more than, than Pilate was. I, I just want to see a miracle. I mean, if, if the stories are true, it seems like by now he's probably feeling like a little safe that and he's not John the Baptist 2.0 because otherwise he'd probably be coming to take me down and he hasn't lifted a finger. So maybe I can get him to lift a finger to do something amazing and see some great thing. I've been wanting to meet this guy for a while now, and now's my chance. So, verse 9, then he questioned with him in many words, but he, Jesus, answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. So this is more of the same. He won't defend himself. Those that are accusing him are trying to trump up charges, being as vehement as they possibly can, trying to convince the judge, in this case Herod, you got to get rid of this guy. You must condemn him. Have, have Pilate do the dirty work fine. Have the Romans crucify him. You don't have to have another beheading. But at least weigh in in our favor, which is against Jesus. And like we saw before, Jesus rising above it all. Not answering Herod a word. Remember earlier when some of the Pharisees had warned Jesus, like, careful, Herod's going to come get you. And, and Jesus said, oh, go tell that fox that I'm here for him whenever he wants to come take me, basically. But call him a fox? Well, now he has the chance to say it to his face. Jesus, non-combative, non-confrontational, but also non-defensive. Doesn't say a word. Which has got to be frustrating for Herod when... You're in charge. You can usually get people to do whatever you want. You can, you can make, make people speak. But he seems to be recognizing greater, greater authority in front of him. So, trying to take Jesus down a few pegs. What does he do instead? Verse 11. Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before, they were at enmity between themselves. Interesting to see Herod here. Fine, you're, you won't dignify me with a response? Then allow me to take away any dignity you might still be holding. Oh, let's, let's take these trumped up charges and trump them up still more. If they're making you king, fine, let's let you look the part. How's this for a convincing costume? Gorgeous robe. And they mock him. This is not the first time that they've done this to Jesus. It's certainly not the last time either. But then that last line is interesting too. This, for some reason, helps Pilate and Herod oh, resolve their differences. There had been some enmity, and that's typically the case between political ruler, uh, rulers, right? Uh, and jurisdictional boundaries. It's interesting that here they are, here's Pilate playing hot potato, when usually it's more like tug of war. And if these two had been fighting over the boundaries and who's in charge of what, by recognizing Herod's authority, well, Pilate was paying him a compliment by sending Jesus his way. That well, didn't do Herod any good. He sent him right back to Pilate. But still it was like, hey, at least he gave me the time of day and sent this political prisoner in my direction. Nice. It's interesting because it does remind me of something Joseph Smith said in Joseph Smith History about all of these other churches and the war of words and the tumult of opinions that Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians were decidedly against one another. But as soon as the restored gospel came onto the scene, that was one thing that the rest could agree on. They could agree to persecute him. 
uh, that you get a sense the same thing happening here with Pilate and Herod. They're against each other, but in reality, they're both against Jesus. And that puts them on the same side. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, as they say. Well, keep reading. In verse 13 of Luke 23, Pilate, now that he's, <laughs> darn it, that didn't work. Uh, jurisdiction, I guess, is mine again. When he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, he said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. At least that's what you say he's been doing. Trying to stoke the fire, trying to stir up some kind of insurrection, perverting the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Here's Pilate feeling like, well, the fact that Herod, who is not exactly known for his mercy and clemency, no, he's known more for his violence. It's kind of a family trait, unfortunately, among the, the Herodians. But the fact that he sent Jesus back to me unharmed, in fact, gorgeously dressed, he seems to think this whole thing is a joke. And I guess the joke's on you. You're so concerned that he's a Jew? Come on, or that he's a king, I should say. You took that seriously? You really think he's trying to create some kind of earthly kingdom? He's not. He was right about that. It was a heavenly kingdom instead. But yeah, let's dress him up and, and make him look the part. And hopefully that will wake you up to realize that this costume party is not worthy of condemnation. Certainly not of capital punishment. And Pilate takes it as such. So we've seen the law of witnesses. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Well, now we're having two witnesses establishing Christ's innocence. And ironically, they're both political leaders that would stand to lose out on something if Christ really were the, the, the coming king. So no, not, not Pilate, not Herod. Can, can we be done here? Again, we see an opportunity for him to just end things and release Jesus back into the, among the people. Well, verse 16, he comes up, Pilate, that is, comes up with another plan. He says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. That's, that's his ultimate plan. I'll rough him up a little bit, and hopefully that will satisfy the people. Uh, it'll, it'll establish some kind of warning anyway. And if Jesus does have any kind of higher political aspirations, hopefully we'll, we'll cure him of that with some chastisement. But then, yeah, we'll release him because... We have no legal leg to stand on for keeping him here. The account goes on, For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And we don't have any evidence outside of the New Testament that that was some kind of a traditional act during the Passover. I mean, it would seem fitting since during the Passover all those who were condemned to a lifetime of perpetual slavery were actually set free instead, that's what the Passover celebrates, then it would, seems like it would be a fitting custom to take someone else who was condemned and let them go free. Well, just do one, some kind of token representative of the house of Israel that is allowed to, to be delivered, even though they don't deserve it. According to the Luke account, Pilate recognizes that and is planning on moving forward with it. And Jesus will be his choice of a released political prisoner. Now, in the John version of this, Pilate reminds the people of this tradition, as if they're trying to keep this off the table. But in John 18, 39, he says to them, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Now, this is another example of what I call Pilate's appeasement policy. If I can just appease people, give them a little of what they want, then hopefully that will be enough to satisfy them so they don't take all that they want. Now, if you know your world history in the 20th century, you know what a problem an appeasement policy can be. That was never Neville Chamberlain's plan with Adolf Hitler. Well, I know it's, he's not really doing good by his neighbors, but... If all he wants is Austria, eh, they speak the same language for crying out loud. Sure, th let's let him take over Austria. He said that's all he wants. 
Oh, he wanted parts of Czechoslovakia too. Well, close enough. Oh, he wants some of the... You see the problem? When you're appeasing someone, you're assuming they'll be satisfied with less. When in reality, all you're doing is whetting their appetite for more. Wait, they're going to give in? And as Hitler realizes, the British are going to let me do what I want? And they're not going to stop? Well, as long as I take it piece by piece, and as long as they keep on backpedaling step by step, then yeah, I can be patient. And I'll still be able to take over Europe, take over the world. Now, appeasement is a problem because they're never satisfied. And Pilate's about to see that. But that's his initial plan. Matthew gives us some additional insight on that. Chapter 27, verse 15. Now, at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. This is going to be the opposite of the scapegoat ritual. Okay, instead of a representative to bear everyone's sins, it's going to be a representative to, to bear the people's pardon and we'll free them. Again, it's as if we are reenacting the Passover when everybody gets to go free. So the, really the only question is, who? Who should we deliver? Well, they had then a notable prisoner. So this is somebody everybody seemed to know about. His crimes were so intense, so extreme, that the Jewish community would have known about him well. In fact, they know him by name. He is called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Again, we see Pilate knows. Pilate wants to free Jesus. He just doesn't want to look weak in front of the people in doing so. He knows there's no reason here. They have no justification for their condemnation. False accusations left and right. It's just envy. <laughs> they, it's the irony of them accusing Jesus of wanting to be a king when it's the Jewish leaders that are trying to be kings themselves. Well, no, that, I'm not going to allow that to happen. But how do I get, how do I sort of honor their concern but still let Jesus go? Oh, a great idea. There's this stroke of genius on Pilate's part. He thinks he found, finds another out. When he first heard the word Galilee, it's like, <gasps> bingo, jurisdictional issues. Send him to Herod. Well, now it's like, darn it, he's back in my, in my lap. What am I going to, ooh, it's Passover. <laughs> Perfect. And these Jews have this custom of releasing a prisoner. Let me pick someone. Oh, this will be perfect. I'll, I'll, t I'll give them two options, okay? It's kind of like parents raising children, and when the kids want to do something wrong, you don't tell them no, you give them two options. But the, the one that they don't want to do, let's make sure that it's the, the lesser of two evils, that it's the, the more preferable of the two. I know they don't want to do their homework, but if I say, well, do you want to do your homework, or do you want to clean the house? Hmm, all of a sudden, the homework doesn't seem so bad. And this is what he's trying to pull off here. Let's set Jesus side by side with a notable prisoner, one that everyone knows is guilty. And I'll allow some kind of semblance of guilt to rest upon Jesus' shoulders. But when I place them both before the people, the, the shock and awe of the, the thought of releasing such a notable prisoner as Barabbas is going to shock them back into their senses of, oh, between those two, we definitely want to keep Barabbas behind bars, which I guess means releasing Jesus. Fine. Uh, we had our fun. We, we mocked him. Uh, we spat upon him. We, we dressed him up in the costume of a king. Okay, costume party's over, because uh, this is getting serious. That, that's Pilate's plan. It's his hope, anyway. In the Mark version of this, chapter 15, verse 7, it makes it even more clear. There was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. I mean, John calls him a robber. Luke says he was in prison for sedition and murder. This is a bad guy, and everybody knows it. The irony is they're saying, oh, Jesus is guilty of insurrection. And Pilate's like, oh, I'll give you somebody who's guilty of insurrection. And everybody knows it. And add sedition and add murder. You want to talk about a treasonable person. 
That's Barabbas to a T. Well, the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And again, this explanation, for he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Let's make this choice crystal clear. And of course, the people will do the right thing. Oh, careful. They haven't been doing the right thing to this point. And by giving in and assuming that they're finally going to come to their senses now, oh, that is a sad misjudgment of their character or lack thereof. Now, beyond all this, Pilate also had an additional reason to set Jesus free. He just couldn't make it look like he was the one doing the freeing. This is in Matthew 27, verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him. So this is Mrs. Pilate now. <laughs> and she said, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream. The JST calls it a vision because of him. Here is a visionary woman, someone with at least some spiritual sensitivity, to have a dream about Jesus of Nazareth and he's righteous. You wonder what she's been hearing behind the scenes. We saw some notable women, disciples of Christ, that were in positions of power in Herod's court. Were there others in Pilate's palace? Were there at least were rumors spreading to the point that Pilate's wife had heard stories about Jesus? How much does she know? How much does she believe? I, I don't, we don't know. But whatever was in the back of her mind, it came to the front of her mind in this visionary dream. And honey, I've got a bad feeling about all this. Do, do not do anything to condemn him. He is a just man. Interesting that she, this Gentile woman, vouches for Jesus. But back to the question, is Pilate going to listen to her? He's always trying to listen to somebody. Is he more concerned about what his wife thinks? Is he more concerned about what the people think? The Jewish leaders, the commoners, uh, the masses, the multitudes. This is a politician through and through. And he's got a wet finger in the air trying to figure out which way the winds of popular opinion are blowing and how do I keep my position at all costs? Well, he's not going to listen to his wife because there's louder voices out there. Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude. Mark says they moved them. So talk about trying to foment rebellion and insurrection. They're the ones stirring the pot, moving the people, persuading them. This is public opinion, which can be so easily turned when you have the right kind of leverage. And these chief priests and elders do. They persuade the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And because of all this <laughs> behind-the-scenes political persuasion, moving the multitudes that the chief priests and elders were, had been doing, what did they cry out? They said, Barabbas. In fact, the Luke account, they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. That's what they want. And Pilate's plan just backfired. I had a real insurrectionist on my hands, but he was in bondage. We caught that guy. And to line him, him up next to Jesus, this was supposed to be a no-brainer, people. Some gentle Jesus who's just going around telling stories about sowers and sheep and you'd rather release the murderer to be back among you now there's something interesting here if he's guilty of murder and sedition and insurrection maybe Pilate misjudged things because maybe this is a hero of the multitudes Rome doesn't like him but maybe Judea does Maybe Barabbas is just the kind of military messiah that they've been hoping for. 
He was just unsuccessful in his earlier insurrection, and he got caught by the Roman authorities and was put in prison. And we thought it was gone for him. But now we're... (laughs) Talk about a get-out-of-jail-free card. Talk about giving a second chance for us to have a military messiah. Maybe we can throw off the Roman yoke after all. Oh yeah, this blew up in Pilate's face. Appeasement usually does. And they demand release Barabbas. Now, one thing that's absolutely beautiful here is the name of this man, this convict. Uh, According to some sources, it was a fairly common name at the time because in some ways it's less a name and more a title. Pick it apart and understand each, each part of it. Bar, Abbas. Now, Bar means son. Remember when Peter was called Simon Bar Jonah? Simon, son of Jonah. So bar means son. And Abba, we heard Jesus use that word in Gethsemane. Abba as in Papa, Daddy, Father. So bar Abbas means son of Father. No, if it's a title, I deserve it. I'm a son of a father. No wonder it's a common name. And it's like the baby comes out and the father looks and goes, ah, that's my boy. (laughs) I'm a father now and that's my son. So he's the son of a father. And it's stuck. There you are, Barabbas. But because of that, who does he represent? Remember, if if there's this custom at Passover to let out a representative prisoner to represent the entire house of Israel that was in bondage in Egypt, and they finally get to go free even though the Egyptians don't think they deserve it? Mm, That that does seem to be a pretty appropriate custom. Who better to do it then? Who better to represent every man than a son of a father, a daughter of a mother, a child of a parent, That's the whole human race. We have seen repeatedly in our study, especially here at the end of all of this, that part of Christ's atonement was a matter of substitution. Some people call it substitutionary atonement, to make it all clear. And if Jesus will take your place, he will substitute himself for you. And that's exactly what's happening here. Barabbas is the guilty one. He deserves the cross. And everyone knows it. Christ is the innocent one. He deserves to be set free. And yet, just like the scapegoat ritual, on the day of atonement, when you take this goat, allow it to stand as substitute for the people. Take all the people's sins and place it upon the head of that sacrificial animal. But not sacrifice it. Simply expel it. Have it cross the Kidron River and go down through the Kidron Valley and off into the wilderness of sin where it's orphaned, left comfortless, will not be able to fend for itself and will most likely die. Falling prey to the beasts of prey that are there. Jesus is our scapegoat. He takes our place. He bears our sins. The iniquity of us all is upon him. And thus he takes our place on the cross. This substitution is profound. We've seen examples of it already. We'll see another example of it by the end of this week's lesson. So hold on to that reality for a moment. Now, Pilate, he's backed himself into a corner. By, oh, why did I... I'm an idiot. I'm an, I, I misjudged. I underestimated just how hell-bent these people are on eliminating Jesus. And now it's... I've put my foot in my mouth. Now I've opened the door and I was hoping they'd let Jesus out through that open door. And instead they're going to let out Barabbas. 
Pilate does not want to condemn Jesus. In Luke 23, 20, Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. So let me, let me try this all over again. That didn't work. Let me try something different. In the Matthew account, 27 verse 22, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? So maybe I can release Barabbas, like they're demanding. I, I, I said I would, and they picked the wrong one, but I have to honor that. But uh, that doesn't mean I have to crucify Christ. I, let me pose the question to them. Fine, you want to free Barabbas? What do you want me to do with Jesus? But that question backfired too. You're in charge, Pilate. Act like it. You have authority. You're the governor. Then govern. But no, he puts it back in the hands of the people, just like he tried to put it in the hands of Herod. And what does he say? What shall I do with Jesus called Christ? And they all say unto him, which again suggests that the chief priests and elders have been persuading them, have been working behind the scenes to mold public opinion along these lines. They all say unto him, let him be crucified. We still want the death penalty, and we'll be satisfied with nothing less than that. Again, that shocks Pilate. And the governor said, why? Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more. Mark says they cried out the more exceedingly when they said, let him be crucified. Again, no reason, no justification. They just refused to be denied. In the JST of the Mark version, by the way, they say, deliver him unto us to be crucified. Away with him. Crucify him. In Luke's account, it's simply the insistent repetition. Crucify him. Crucify him. Can you picture the crowd starting to chant it? The multitudes expressing the popular will. And Pilate getting more and more nervous as he starts to do the math in his mind and seeing the the crowds calling out for Christ's crucifixion. What what am I going to do? There's... There's no way out here. The JST version of Mark, by the way, is an interesting one. Turn him over to us. We'll crucify him. Talk about a complete abdication of Roman authority, since that's capital punishment is not something they allowed the the Jews to execute. But no, give it to us, and we'll take care of things if if you're so gun-shy or faint at the sight of blood, which Pilate was not, by the way. According to extra-biblical records, he was brutal. If anything, we get a softer depiction of Pilate in the Gospels than we do in in other sources. Well, again, he's going to try to push back against the persuaded people. Luke 23, verse 22, he said unto them the third time. Hmm, didn't we see something last week that happened three times? Interesting parallel here. Peter's three denials. Well, in a way, these are three denials of responsibility on Pilate's part. The third time he speaks up for Jesus and asks again, why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. He could add, neither did Herod. We've got all kinds of witnesses establishing his innocence. Then why do you want me to treat him as if he were guilty? So his new plan, I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Well, they, the multitudes, were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. So ultimately, they they had their way. And with all of the acts of appeasement along the path, no wonder they knew they could get there. They could get their way from Pilate. So Luke 23, verse 24, Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required complete abdication of his own responsibility. Fine, do it your way. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And that's an ironic statement too. He who always delivered his will to the Father was now being delivered to the will of the people. And that would not bode well for him. Now, what we've seen so far in Pilate is a spineless, 
politician. Someone who simply wants to keep control. At whatever cost, he is too weak-willed to stand up to the people that he's supposed to be leading. This is the, dog wa the tail wagging the dog. And the people telling their leader what they demanded. And as we see in Mark chapter 15, verse 15, so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Now that verse ends with a nod to the crucifixion, but it suggests something that happened along the way when he had scourged him. You remember when it said that I'll, I'll chasten him, I'll chastise him and then let him go. He, again, he, Pilate is doing everything he can to pass the buck, to wash his hands, to re avoid any kind of responsibility or culpability in the matter. By the way, pause for a second. Our villains. Last week, we saw Judas and the betrayal. We saw Peter and the thrice denial. Here we're seeing Pilate with his policy of appeasement. Last week I told you what we hate about them is what we see in ourselves. And are we guilty of similar things as far that, that Pilate is? Do we sometimes try to, oh, serve God without offending the devil? Do we sometimes try to have it both ways and have two masters and honor Jesus, at least with our lips, uh, but really not wanting to do it in a way that would cause problems among the worldly wise? I don't want to get kicked out of the secular synagogue, as we've said before. I don't want to lose my place in the world. And so to fully follow someone whose kingdom is not of this world, then oh, that's pulling me out of earthly kingdoms. I don't want that. Is there some kind of way I can have the best of both worlds? Can I have dual citizenship in Zion and Babylon? Can I hold to Jesus and still do the devil's bidding when necessary. I do fear that we're guilty of similar things. And Pilate has been personifying this in everything we've seen him do so far. This moment is one of the worst. So far, it hasn't cost Jesus too much. Now, yes, he was mocked and ridiculed before Herod. But so far, Jesus has been relatively safe in in Pilate's hands. Pilate wants to let him go, go free. That'd make his wife happy, a little better at home. But not better in public. The people would be out to get me after that. So I've got to appease them. And maybe this is a way I can have the best of both worlds. If I can give them a little of what they want. Again, the Barabbas thing backfired. But if I can rough him up. If I can chastise him to the point of physical punishment, enough to shock the Jews back into their senses. You want blood? Well, let me give you some. Maybe the taste in your mouth will wake you up to the fact that it's not sweet. This is a bitter cup of your own design, and so drink some yourself, and maybe that will jolt you back into a sense of responsibility and reality. Like, I do not want this blood on my hands. I mean, the pilot's feeling that. I want to wash my hands of it. Maybe they do too. And so let me give them a little. Maybe they're just going along with the crowd. Maybe it is the, the, the puppet on, and the puppeteers are the chief priests and elders. And if I can wake the people up, I'm scared of the people. The Jewish leaders probably are too. And if I can just convince the people, is this really what you want? I'll give you a taste of it, a preview of coming executions, and hopefully that will jolt you into a sense. Maybe you'll hear the cock crow. Maybe you'll go out and weep bitterly. Maybe you'll realize, what was I doing? Maybe you'll be like Judas, and you'll run back and have buyer's remorse, or in this case, betrayer's remorse, and bring the coins back to the temple and say, I don't want to have anything to do with this, and can we stop? before we go any further. Yeah, let me give them a little of what they're asking for and it will 
cure them from wanting to go all the way. Well, I can see why, you, why the logic there. But if this backfires, then you've added insult to injury. So this scourging and hoping that it ends there, that this is the climax rather than just crescendo to something even worse. So John 19, verse 1, 2, and 3, this part of the account is best described in the book of John. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. This is a repetition of so much we've already seen. The purple robe, the, the mockery. Herod had just done that. The mockery, the, the Caiaphas and Annas had just done that the night before. The physical persecution, the smiting with their hands, well, the, that had happened in Caiaphas' palace the night before as well. But the scourging is something new. And this is brutal. Again, trying to save the sensitivity of some of your, of some of your ears I don't want to get into all the brutal details, but I feel I must explain at least some of the realities that went into scourging. It was so intense that there had to be a limit placed upon it. Forty stripes, save one, is how it's usually referred to. Is there, will the Roman soldiers here keep to a limit of 39 lashes? Because anything beyond that, oh, that's cruel and unusual punishment. And this is coming from a people that don't think much is cruel or unusual. They're sadly kind of used to it all. And to take a scourge, which is a whip, often they would have little pieces of metal or sharpened pieces of bone that were tied or woven into these leather straps. The metal parts would as the soldiers would, would lash their victim, typically with arms outstretched to fully expose the back of the body. Sometimes they would alternate sides or have two different people to whip from different angles to kind of crisscross the back of, the, of their victim with lacerations that would just leave the back Shredded, for lack of a better word. Again, I'm sorry for how graphic this, this is. But what Jesus endured, if we're going to view his death and everything that led up to it, the pieces of metal would cause deep bruising. The pieces of bone would increase the laceration. There would be a significant blood loss, and this is already on top of all the blood that Jesus lost the night before. To see what is happening here is a fulfillment in graphic detail of what Isaiah said it would be. And since Jesus knew Isaiah and knew that Isaiah was referring to him, part of his patriarchal blessing, as we've, as we've described it, Jesus would have known these words, and now he was feeling them keenly. Isaiah 53, that great suffering servant song. Notice verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Those three words, wounded, bruised, and stripes, describe scourging perfectly. Peter reflected on this and brought it up again in his first epistle. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, as he's reflecting on the crucifixion of Christ, he said, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. That was Christian courage on his part, non-confrontational. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. I'm content to go into Judas's hands, or Pilate's hands, or Herod's hands, because through it all I am in God's hands. 
and I trust him. But then Peter says this, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The tree meaning the cross, that is. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. And then Peter quotes the same Isaiah passage we just did. By whose stripes ye were healed. Stripes that were meant for our back. A cross that each Barabbas, each of us, was meant to be nailed to. That's what heals us. Talk about substitution. Talk about trading places. And that's only part. That's the most physical aspect of this. What about the psychological? I mean, in some ways, the crown of thorns was the combination of the two. Because the thorns would add incredible physical pain, but the psychological mockery of it being a crown upon your head this is the opposite of Mary's crown of liquid love that we talked about when she anointed him with her pound of spikenard. It's no longer oil that is coming down his face, but it's his own blood. It is not a crown of glory or a crown of love. It is a crown of pain. And a crown of... I'll put it this way. I've shared this before, that most of the time when people attack faith, they try a combination of minimizing and maximizing. Or you could call it dismissing and demonizing. You remember the, the, what we see at the top of the computer screen, where there's a minimize button and a maximize button, and then a just close it all down button. And that's the approach that is usually taken. The minimize is let's dismiss this. Let's make a mockery of it. Let's point the finger and laugh and turn someone into scorn. And this is now a joke to be laughed at and reduced to the absurd and just dismiss them. What's the point? They will then leave themselves. These are the people that drop the fruit of the tree of life because of them pointing fingers and the mockery from the great and spacious building. That's what they're doing with their, this crown of thorns and this purple robe. Like, get a load of this guy. That's what Herod was trying to accomplish, right? But then the maximize, if that doesn't work, maximize is to demonize. This, this is not a joke to be laughed at. This is an enemy to, that must be overcome, lest he overcome us. This is when we get up in arms and we're not pointing fingers. We're brandishing swords. And it's not the psychological scorn. It's the physical trauma. It's persecution. It's pain. Either way, our ultimate goal is to end this. Shut the whole thing down. And you'll see that repeatedly in Scripture, the combination of the two. We see it very clearly here. I do love the symbolism, however. Crown of thorns, purple robe. Think of thorns the first time we ever come in contact with them. And that's post-Eden. That because of the fall, the earth fell as well, and no longer bringing forth fruit without even having to cultivate things. Now it's going to be bread brought forth by the sweat of your brow. And in this case, just like the night before in Gethsemane, it would be a bloody sweat. To bring forth the bread of life for us all. Thorns and thistles it will breed. Thorns? Yeah, Jesus is wearing them now. He takes the fall and crowns himself with it in order to make it into atonement. There's something powerful here. And again, the purple robes. Purple was the sign of royalty. Uh, in Edward Gibbons' mammoth history of the decline, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, whenever he refers to Rome, the shorthand he uses is the purple. And he's just, he always talks about Caesar and the Roman leaders as the purple. That's what sets them apart as royalty. It was so expensive to use, to find purple dye that only the, the, the rich, the lofty could afford it. Well, here they're mock, making a mockery of Jesus by dressing him in that. Again, to poke fun that this guy thinks he's the king of the Jews. But also there's something powerful about the color purple in its combination of 
the red and the blue. Bruised for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed. What do we call, what color do we use that we associate with bruising? Black and blue. And what color do we associate with pain and blood is red. So fuse those together with Isaiah's help. And here you see a purple robe, not just the mockery of royalty, but the combination of all that Jesus is going through for our sake. Take all of that. Add it to Matthew 27 and its account of all of this. Verse 27, Mark's account, by the way, is almost identical here. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And the numbers there, it's hard to put an exact figure on there, but most likely this would have been hundreds of people. That's what constitutes a band of soldiers. It's not a full legion. But can you imagine being surrounded by that many people who are hardened to physical pain? They experience it. They inflict it. It's what they do. It's the violent type. They've been self-selected for this. And this whole band of soldiers is now ganging up on Jesus. They stripped him. They put on him a scarlet robe. Mark changes that to purple. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Matthew then adds, And they spat upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. You see that reed, if the, if the robe was a, a mock, oh, if the robe was meant to ro mock his royalty, well then the reed was a mock scepter of power. And they put it in his hand, and they kneel before him, and oh hail king of the Jews. But then they take that scepter and end up striking him with it instead, spitting in his face. Again, a repetition of what he suffered the night before. The humiliation, the psychological suffering, the physical agony, everything that Jesus is enduring here. In the John version of this, back to chapter 19, verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. He, how many times? I've lost track. How many times has he said that? How many times has he established Christ's innocence? And so to put in perspective why he's doing this, the, the statement, the verdict of innocent, and then let me portray a picture of guilt. And we'll bring him out and let you see. I hope it satiates your bloodthirst. I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. In Latin, that is ecce homo. And that has become a phrase that encapsulates this whole part of the story. Behold the man. Behold means to look. Look at him. You see what Pilate is trying to help them recognize Make them, force them to see. Look at this. Look at what you're demanding, what you're asking for. Look, about, look at the results of your decisions. No wonder Jesus asked the apostles, watch with me. No wonder Jacob is pleading and persuading us to view his death. Behold the man, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The man of holiness, making up for our lack of holiness. Don't we see what we've done to him? Isn't it enough to wake us up and make us want to repent of our sins, to go no further down this road? Look at him. Is this what you're asking for? Is this your so-called king? Fine. Let's Make him wear the costume. Maybe you'll laugh. And the, the ridicule will be enough for you to wake you up. Then again, maybe you'll see the blood coming down his face. You'll see him 
struggling to stay standing after the intense agony of a scourging. The multitudes surrounded, did they hear the, the crack of the whip? Do they know what Jesus has just endured? And will it be enough for them? Has it been has he been minimized enough that we can end things now? Has it, it, he been maximized enough? Has he been dismissed and demonized and everything in between to the point that you're, you're ready to end this in a better way, not to crucify him, but to chastise him and let him go? That seems to have been Pilate's goal from the beginning. Then again, as I said, if extra-biblical sources paint a more brutal picture of him, maybe he's not trying to let Jesus go at all. Maybe he is trying to force the issue. Remember, the Jewish leaders were scared to death of any kind of riot, because if there's a riot during Passover week, the Roman authorities were, that are all in town for the same concerns, oh, they're going to destroy us. Forget waiting for... Titus in 70 AD. We can do this right now under Pilate. So yeah, here's your king. <laughs> this is what a, a king of the Jews looks like as far as the Romans are concerned. And so don't get any hopes up. You are under the Roman thumb and you'll stay that way. Is that another reason he's letting Barabbas go? Here's an, here's an insurrectionist. So yeah, I dare you, Barabbas, try again almost taunting the people, not just mocking Jesus, but mocking the Jews. This is the kind of king you deserve. And this is what we do to Jewish kings. This is what we do to rebellions against Rome. Bring it on. That, that would be an interesting kind of throwing down the gauntlet, trying to get something going here. That's a possibility as far as Pilate's concerned, too. Well, as far as the chief priests are concerned, they just want Jesus gone. And so they make those demands. We're not satisfied. You have not satiated our bloodthirstiness. We want more. And so John chapter 19, verse 6 and 7, when the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, crucify him, crucify him. They haven't changed their tune at all. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now there's another bait and switch, just like Caiaphas had done the night before. This was never about insurrection. This was always about blasphemy. But blasphemy is what we care about. And we wanted to kill him for that. Knowing that you don't care about that, we had to switch things into insurrection. But it's like they, they, they slipped and they admitted more than they had intended. But the phrase that came out of their lips, it's more than just king of the Jews. What did they say here? Son of God. Ooh. That was alarming to Pilate. That phrase jolted him back into a reality of, wait a minute, this is even bigger than I thought. What is truth? Are you the king? Where's your kingdom from? We, I made it through that conversation. But if we're talking not just king, but son of God, who am I dealing with here? Who, who, who is wearing the crown? And it's not a crown of thorns. Go on to verse 8, and you'll see how startled Pilate is by this, this new wrinkle in the accusation. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? So not just who art thou, but whence? Where do you come from? They, they call you Jesus of Nazareth. Is that really where you're from? Now Jesus gave him no answer. He's done with this conversation. I've already told you what you need to know. 
But then saith Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Me? Do you not know who you're dealing with? I, I, well, I'm not sure who I'm dealing with, but don't you know who you're speaking to? He says, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? I'm in charge here, which again is ironic since he certainly hasn't been acting like it. I have power? Then how, why haven't you been using it, Pilate? You've been trying to avoid using your power to crucify. Then why don't you use your power to release? You've already admitted repeatedly that you know I'm innocent. No, Jesus doesn't speak to any of this. It's as if Jesus himself is washing his hands since he knows that's what Pilate's about to do himself. Nope. The wheels are in motion and you've done nothing to turn them in the direction of justice. But then Jesus does decide to speak up. It must have been triggered by that last statement on Pilate's part. He doesn't have to defend himself. He's, he's not interested in that. But when Pilate claims the power for himself, I'm in charge here. I'm going to determine whether you will live or die. No, that, that rubs Jesus the wrong way. And so he speaks out. He calls Pilate out on it. Verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, greater, that doesn't absolve Pilate of sin himself. You're guilty too, just not as guilty as those that delivered me into your hands. But it is amazing what Jesus just said to him. You, power? No. You have none. I will decide whether I live or die, not you. God has determined my fate. I'm not interested in your so-called power. You have none. Well, again, that wakes up Pilate. And again, he's concerned. And so, next verse. From thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. He keeps trying, but only so much, half-heartedly, not wanting to lose face before the people he's supposed to be ruling. Well, they're ruling him. Sure enough, the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And that's another word that captures Pilate's attention. Wait, son of God? Who am I dealing with? Uh-oh, Caesar? Ooh, I know who I'm dealing with there. And speaking of not really having authority, and I'm only here because someone else has put me in place, ooh, that describes my politics. And it's a precarious position I'm in. I can't go against Caesar. Okay, fine. Then will you go against Christ? Will you go against conscience? Will you do what's... Will you do something wrong when you know better? That's the decision that Pilate is making. But think for a moment about what the Jews just said. You're no friend of Caesar. Well, as if the Jews were. The Jews hate Caesar. They hate suffering under the Roman yoke. And now they're trying to maintain it? They're threatening one Roman against, by pitting him against another Roman so that the Romans will stay in charge? That, this is irony as far as the eye can see. What really the Jewish leaders want to maintain their little piece of power. And they know that Pilate wants to do the same. So you preserve your piece of power. And as long as the big fish doesn't swallow you up, then you won't swallow us up. And we'll all be able to swim around in our little private ponds and feel like we're all the big fish among our people. So interesting what's happening, especially in light of the fact that Jesus has already made it crystal clear. It's not, that's not my kind of kingdom. So I can be a friend of Caesar, if you want to call it that, and a friend of Pilate. And really, I'm trying to be a friend of everyone. But to see what the people are doing with that, nope, if I can oversimplify things and make it seem like Jesus is 
anti-Roman, then we'll win and Rome will have to take care of things. Uh, verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. P Pilate had to preserve his own position, even if it meant he couldn't preserve Christ's life. So when he heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. He just told them, Behold the man. But Jesus is more than a man. He is the king. Pilate seems to recognize it. He's admitting it. He's shoving it right back in the face of the Jewish leaders. This is your king. And you really want to crucify him? Behold him. This is the last look you'll get. Is that really where we're going? As the Passover is being prepared, as the sixth hour is striking, sixth hour is high noon. This is supposed to be the moment of greatest light. Then explain your dark deeds. This is the preparation of the Passover. Remember, this is John's version of it all. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, Passover was yesterday. The Last Supper was the Passover feast. But in John, and the beautiful sim uh, symbolism he's trying to convey here, remember John chapter 1, Behold, the Lamb of God. That's who Jesus has been from the very beginning of this book. And now as the book comes to its close, it's the Lamb of God that is now the Passover Lamb being slain for the sins of the world. So in John's account, the Passover Lambs are being prepared. That's exactly what's happening. They are being sent to Jewish authorities so those lambs can be slain. Their blood spilled to commemorate the blood on the doorposts that spelled freedom to everyone that entered it therein. Pilate, you're, you're a Jewish puppet right now. And the Jews are preparing their Passover lamb. Unbeknownst to them, exactly what prophecies they're fulfilling. And I love the way John is, is placing this. Passover as we speak and the Lamb of God being prepared for his sacrifice. But again, all that's lost on the Jews. Verse 15 and 16. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? This is such a back and forth and a hot potato. I don't want to do it, but you are forcing me to. Is this really what you're demanding? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Which, again, is so hypocritical, so ironic. Really? Okay, you admitted it. You have no king. You will be loyal subjects to Rome. Remember that. And in 40 years, when the Roman army comes and crushes you, will you still be singing this tune? No king but Caesar? Well, it's over now. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. The Jewish leaders have shown their true colors. They would rather be slaves to Caesar than servants of God. There's a fascinating line in Milton's Paradise Lost where Lucifer is so adamant to continue in his rebellion and to, to push the fall all the way through to completion. And in this fascinating line of self-justification, Lucifer says, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Oh, how's that for belligerence? How's that for in your face? I'm wrong. I don't care. And the Jewish leaders have admitted that. I'd rather rule in hell, in my little private corner of it anyway. I'd rather have Caesar as my king than Jesus. Because he's going to turn me into a servant of the living God, and that is a being I will not serve. Finally, Matthew 27, verse 24 and 25. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, 
Despite all of his half-hearted attempts, despite all of his acts of appeasement, when he saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, and things are starting to get out of hand, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Fine. You don't want to be responsible. We will be. Now, like I said before, that does not absolve Pilate. Elder Maxwell once said that never were his hands dirtier than right after he washed them. He wasn't washing his hands of guilt. He was trying to wash away his responsibility. But that's a stain that sticks. You, you're, in, you're supposed to be in charge. Act like it. You know better. Live up to your responsibility. Judas, no more betraying. Peter, no more denying. Pilate, no more appeasing. All of us. If we believe these things, see that we do them. If we have a testimony of Christ, then we must act like it. And live up to what we know. But as we saw at the end of that passage, the Jews of the time, their leaders at least, were more than happy to take the responsibility. And whatever blood was going to be on Pilate's hands, oh, we'll take those, fine. In fact, put them upon us and upon our children. Now, please beware of that statement. Because that, has, that verse has been used to justify anti-Semitism ever since. And so often... When Jews have been made to suffer at the hands of so-called Christians, they'll point to a passage like that and say, you asked for it. You killed Christ and you took responsibility and you wanted his blood not just to be upon the original perpetrators, but on through their posterity. Now, don't we say something in the second article of faith about children not being responsible for their parents' sins? Hold on to that. And we will actually see later in the book of Acts that the blood of Christ is meant to forgive, not condemn. And condemn and to forgive even posterity. There's hope for us all. Do not allow verses like that to justify something that Jesus himself would never stand for. Okay? But with that... The path to Calvary has now been cleared, and there's nowhere to go but forward. Jesus is not going to be released by Pilate. So, Matthew 27, verse 31, after that they had mocked him, and they took the robe off from him, and even that brief phrase would have been agonizing for Jesus to have been scourged, to have been stripped first and then scourged, to have so many open wounds, bleeding wounds upon his back, and then to have a purple robe placed upon him. Have you ever had a, a sunburn so bad you don't want anything to touch it, not even clothing? Well, a sunburn is nothing compared to what Jesus has endured. And so to have that robe upon his back would have been excruciating, but then to have it removed taken off. How long had it been? Had the wounds, had the blood dried somewhat, soaked into the fabric, and then to have it ripped away, reopening those wounds, yet more bleeding? They took the robe off. They put his own raiment back on him and led him away to crucify him. Now compare that to what Jesus had done throughout his entire mortal ministry. He spat in the dirt and made clay to heal the blind man. Well, they're spitting too, but spitting in his face. He laid his hands upon people's heads to heal them, to bless them, to empower them. And they are laying hands on his head to smite and to slap, to buffet and to bruise. Jesus always took his robes of righteousness to cover the nakedness of those around him. And here they are, 
covering and then stripping him, making a mockery every step of the way. Notice it said at the end that they led him. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the one that's leading his sheep. But toward salvation, not toward condemnation. That's what they're doing to him. In verse 32, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. We have heard of this story before. Simon the Cyrenian bearing the cross of Jesus. It wouldn't have been the entire cross. The vertical post was typically already fixed in the ground there on Calvary. But the cross beam that the victim would be nailed to and then lifted up and put in place upon that vertical post. Remember the horizontal beam is what represents the second great commandment, loving neighbor? I think it's fitting that a neighbor, Simon, would come to help bear the horizontal cross beam of Christ's own cross. It tells me something, by the way, that if your cross ever gets too hard and too heavy, Look around, and typically the Lord will have put someone right in your path. Simon happened to be passing by, but right person at right place at right time to make a difference and to do something for Jesus. So seldom do we get to actually do something for him he can't do for himself. Well, because of that intense blood loss, Jesus was in no condition to be able to walk Roughly the third of a mile. He'd already been walking a lot, a lot, probably over two miles by now in this sleepless night of going from upper room to Garden of Gethsemane to Caiaphas Palace into Pilate. And that last third of a mile, give or take, to get to Golgotha. He couldn't do and still bear the cross himself. And so... Simon was provided, and God always tends to do the same thing for us. But one great difference, here it said that he was compelled to bear Christ's cross, and Christ will never compel us to do that. Throughout Scripture, he invites us to take up the cross, daily even. Some places it's to take up Christ's cross, more often it's to take up our cross, which the scriptures define as denying ourselves of all ungodliness. That can be a heavy burden. We might need additional help. We might, might need loving neighbors to come and help bear that up through the, the kindness of the second great commandment. But there's no compulsion here. There's no coercion. It's simply invitation in hopes that we'll bear the cross right alongside him. In the Mark account of this, Chapter 15, verse 21, they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, like I said, he just happened to be there, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Remember when we met Bartim blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus? And I mentioned that my old New Testament professor years ago had said, yeah, you can spot Mark's fingerprints by some because sometimes he includes irrelevant details. You didn't need to know the name of the blind man, let alone his father's name. And remember when we talked about that, I pushed back and said, well, for Jesus, he knows names. He cares about relationships. How are you, Bartimaeus? It's been a while. How's your dad? How's Timaeus doing? Here again, is this just another example of Mark's irrelevance? Okay, fine. He was named Simon. I nice to know his name. It's just some guy. This is the only moment he appears in the Gospels. He happened to be passing by. This seems to be random. And hey, you look like you got a strong back and pick this thing up. If Romans, Roman soldiers can compel you to walk a mile and bear their burdens, well, this is just a third of a mile, give or take. We're taking it easy on you. Just do the job. We don't care who you are. Well, God does. So a name, Simon. A backstory. He's from Cyrene or Cyrene as it's often pronounced. More than that, he has relationships. He's a father. He has sons. They've got names too. Alexander, Rufus. 
Some have suggested, in fact, there's a JST that says that he's a disciple, Simon is. Is that an observant Orthodox Jew coming to Jerusalem from all the way from North Africa? Cyrene is Libya. And to come to join with other Jews in the pilgrimage feast? Is he a Christian disciple? It suggests that, yes, that's the case. Is that why he's so close, happened to be passing by? Or was this the first step of his discipleship? Was this a conversion experience for him? To the point that his whole family then stayed faithful, to the point that years later when Mark is writing to his community the story of Jesus, he can mention Simon and include the detail. Oh yeah, that, you, you, have you met Alexander? Do you know Rufus? It's their dad. And if I were Alexander or Rufus, that would be my claim to fame. That would be my connection to Christ. My dad, our father, bore his cross. And it's, that was a weight of glory for him that he could do anything for Jesus in those final moments. Dad not only bore Christ's cross, he bore his own ever after, as will we. I wonder if Mark is just calling his community into Christian conviction by mentioning these names. The Luke version of it is similar. As they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross. But then this detail that only Luke gives us, that he might bear it after Jesus. I do love the thought that he followed behind. He let Jesus lead the way, even towards the cross. And Simon bore it as he followed. Sometimes following Jesus will feel that heavy. Sometimes taking up our cross or his will be such a heavy burden where it feels like it's, we're being crushed under our load. But if that's what following Jesus entails, then please give me the cross beam. It's my chance to come close to him. I also love the idea of it being behind Jesus because it kept it out of Jesus' eyes. He didn't have to see it. My mission president once talked uh, this is my second mission president. He said to us, that, that detail about carrying a cross, it, it would have been hard to do it in front of you. Like it was like a big weight that you were curling. No, you throw it over your shoulder, kind of drag it behind you. And the beauty of that, as he described, and this was an image that, that stuck with me, you don't have to fixate on your trials, even while you're burying them. Keep them behind you. Keep your eyes up, looking at other things. Stay focused on the positive. Even when you're struggling, suffering, weighed down, keep the cross behind you, even as you bear it. Now, in Jesus' case, without having to look at the cross, what was he able to look at instead? Well, look at the next verse. Luke 23, verse 27. There followed him a great company of people and of women, and it's just like Luke to always include women whenever they're, they're present. These magnificent sister saints that are following Jesus, wanting to be as close to him as possible, what are they doing? They also bewailed and lamented him. They're not in the crowds chanting, crucify him. They're among oh, a more meager multitude, a mournful one, bewailing, lamenting. And yet Jesus, he turns unto them and he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. He's not thinking of, of children bearing the sins of their fathers, but he is recognizing that children will have, will bear the brunt of some of their, their father's sins when it comes to the Roman occupation that's only four decades away. What I'm facing today will soon be over so weep not for me. You have no idea what's awaiting you. You daughters of Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you? As a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. This maternal imagery. And to these mothers in Israel, these daughters of Jerusalem, oh, I wish 
I could be here to cover you, to protect you. You will want to protect your little ones. That's a mother's heart for you. And yet you'll be unable because of what is on its way. Oh, yeah. I appreciate your tears of, of mourning with those that mourn. I wish I could comfort those that will someday stand in need of comfort. Well, by then it will be up to the comforter to do that. But you have no idea what awaits you. This is Jesus, as usual, caring for others more than he cared about himself. This is him comforting the apostles and their troubled hearts, even when his heart was more troubled than theirs. This is him healing the servant of the high priest there in Gethsemane from a mere flesh wound on the ear when he had just bled from every pore. This is Jesus comforting his comforters, turning it back toward them, thinking of what they were going to face more than what he was imminently facing personally. He says to them in verse 29, For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Think about that. Things will get so intense that watching your children go through these things will feel worse than not having any children at all. That's intense. You will wish you had been barren. This kind of goes along with what he'd said about the second coming and how intense that will be. Oh, those woe to those that are with child, those that have not yet weaned their children, because it will be too hard to flee Babylon and come to Zion. During the Roman occupation and destruction of Jerusalem, you sisters, you tender mother hearts, have no idea what your children will go through. And yet there's also another possibility here that had never crossed my mind until yesterday as I was pondering these things some more. The thought, uh, the one hand, what I just described, this is a, a consequence of evil. Because of the people's evils, Rome will come and destroy things and it will leave you wishing you had no children. That's the consequence of sin. But I wonder, could that also be a a symptom of sin. Not just saying the days are coming where you'll wish you had no children, but rather the days will someday come where people in general will wish that they had no kids. And what a tragic piece of evidence that priorities have been completely turned on their head. What a tragedy to have to live in a day where children are considered burdens instead of blessings. Of, oh, they have, there's a burden part. I, I get it. Believe me. But the burden is so far outweighed by the blessing. So it makes the burden worth it. That's the purpose we're here. That's the plan of salvation. Multiply and replenish the earth. And yet, do we live in a day of marriage, time getting postponed? Because there's so much I want to do myself before I get to that point, get saddled with a spouse. And then children being postponed as well, and family size being so limited, because kids just get in the way. And you can't do what you want to do, and self-actualization, come on, because it's the world, it's all about you, right? Oh, sadly, we do live in a day. Those days that Jesus said are coming are now fully here where people will say, and society says it, and social media says it in so many different ways, blessed are the barren, because you have no responsibility toward anyone but your selfish little self. Talk about reversing reality. We're playing the wrong game. When, when society tells you that being a mother or father is beneath you, yeah, we've got a problem. Then verse 30 and 31, Jesus ends his conversation with these women. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. This is just like Alma the Younger in his pre-repentance, wishing to be hidden from the all-seeing eye of God. Just cover me with a mountaintop somewhere. He says, for if they do these things in a green tree, 
Oh, what shall be done in the dry? Kind of cryptic, but what an interesting statement. Christ is the green tree. If it's green, it's living. It still has living water coming up from its roots. It's still bearing fruit. And yet they're trying to chop down a green tree. They're, they're going to reduce the forest to ashes. And if they're willing to do that when the trees are alive, then imagine how quickly they'll go up in smoke when the trees are dry. You ever gone through a forest or the, a national park and seen the Smokey the Bear sign? And there it is with the different, like the green and the yellow and the orange and the red. And it says, uh, what are the chances of a forest fire? And when it cautions you and says that the potential for fire is extreme, oh, you can't even afford to light a match. No fire allowed. And here's Jesus, the source of all living water. If, we, if we're not going to make it, and in some ways this reminds me of that haunting caution in Matthew 24, that if those days aren't shortened, then no flesh shall be saved. We... If you're, not, if you're barely going to survive when there still are places uh, to tap into living water, and, but even if that, it's hard to survive the increasing heat all around you, then imagine what are your hopes and chances if you are bone dry, if you have allowed yourself to succumb to a famine in the land for li bread of life and living water. And if, if you are not seeking to sink your roots into, into deep waters, this goes back to the parable of the sower. If you're on stony ground and no depth of earth and no root in yourself, then when the hot sun comes to beat down, you will shrivel, shrivel and die. It's only green trees that can survive that. Dry ones don't stand a chance. So yes, we must tap in to the living water. The JST here, by the way, adds a little explanation, saying, This he spake, signifying the scattering of Israel and the desolation of the heathen, or in other words, the Gentiles. And that's an interesting clarification. Scattering of Israel? Desolation through the Gentiles? That's what you mean by weep not for me, but weep for, for yourself? That's what you mean by green trees versus dry? We're talking another scattering of Israel? I thought we already went through that with the Assyrians. Oh, and the Babylonians. Oh, and the Greeks. You mean it's going to happen again through the Romans? Yeah. That's why you've got to weep for your own children. That's why you've got to prepare them to stand in holy places and be not moved. Prepare them to listen to the voice of, a pro of apostles who will lead you to Pella, and away from the destruction of Jerusalem. Because yes, Rome will scatter Israel yet again. It keeps on happening. And with that, there's nothing left but Calvary ahead. In John chapter 19, verse 17, he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. You see, John makes no mention of Simon. He, he suggests Jesus bearing his own cross. Maybe he started that way and couldn't continue, and then Simon was compelled to help. But either way, here we see Golgotha, the place of a skull. In Aramaic, that's what Golgotha means. In Matthew and in Mark, they mention Golgotha as well. They call it the place of the skull. And yet, in all three of those accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John, the JST changes all of them from the place of the skull to the place of burial. Now, that doesn't change the meaning of the word Golgotha. In, in Luke, it's the one that mentions Calvary, but that's another translation of the same term also. Any of them, I mean, Golgotha, Calvary, it all means head or skull. And some have wondered, does that, is that describing some kind of topographic feature? That there, it was kind of round, a hill that was round on top, so it looks like a, a skull? Or there are kind of cavities or 
depressions within the, the face of it, face quote unquote, so it looked like eye sockets. Is there some, some outcropping outside of Jerusalem that looks like a skull? Well, how's that for Golgotha? How's that for Calvary? Then again, others have suggested, well, if it's simply a place of burial, and the JST points in that direction, then is this a place of the skull, not because of what it looks like, but because of what, is, what takes place there? A place of burial, a place of death, a place of skulls and bones. Oh, a woeful place. And is that where they're taking Jesus? In Mark 15, verse 23, they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. One last act they, they do before the crucifixion actually occurs. But, Mark is crystal clear here, he, Jesus, received it not. Now, where Mark calls it wine mingled with myrrh, the JST calls it vinegar mingled with gall. And that fits some of the other gospel accounts. It better matches Matthew, for example. But again, it says, when he had tasted the vinegar, he would not drink. Now, at the time, and this was often the, the role of wealthy women. They would mix together wine and myrrh or vinegar or gall, whatever they could find as some kind of anesthetic. And if they were wealthy enough, then they'd have the money to be able to gather those kinds of supplies and donate them. If they were wealthy enough, they pr probably protected somewhat against death and pain and wanted to protect others from it as well. So almost like a, a woman, woman's benevolent society. And they would do whatever they could not to release the criminal, but to soften the blow of his execution. There's actually a fascinating verse in Proverbs 31. Remember that great final chapter of Proverbs about the virtuous woman and all the incredible things that she does? Well, this is Proverbs 31 verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Are they simply trying to be virtuous women? And however they feel about, feel about Jesus, if he deserves to die or if he's been condemned unjustly, there's no stopping it now. Can we at least soften the blow? Can we take the edge off of his agony and give him something to deaden his senses. But how does Jesus react? As soon as he recognizes what they're putting to his lips. This is not water to help the green tree. No, they're trying to, well-meaning, they're trying to help. This is just like these wonderful sisters coming to weep for me. But no, weep for yourself. I don't need your tears and I don't need your help because I have to experience all of this. When we saw in King Benjamin's words that Jesus would suffer more hunger, more thirst, more fatigue, and more pain than any mere mortal could suffer, except it be unto death, you would die of hunger, you'd die of thirst, you'd die of fatigue, or you'd die of pain. But Jesus' divine side refused to give his human side an easy exit. He's still doing it here. And to these well-meaning sisters, saints, no, I will not take an anesthetic. I must feel every pain so that it's infinite and eternal. That's what the atonement must be. I couldn't help but think also of a young Joseph Smith. I know this is an infinitely far cry from what Jesus endured. But to be a little boy and to have your leg operated on with saws and drills and pliers and to be offered strong drink since you won't be strong enough to handle this. And this little boy refuses. Now, we don't know all the reasons why. Sometimes we want to say, well, it's the word of wisdom. It, that was still years away. Oh, was he just part of the temperance movement? Well, maybe. Was the family more concerned about those kinds of things? It was a common concern at the time. But under the circumstances, you're going to stick to those guns when you're going to go through a brutal, unproven surgery? When the, when the reality was we typically just amputate. 
That's painful, but it's fast. Faster than this. And yeah, we give alcohol for that as well. But this little boy, no. What's he do instead? He asks mother to leave. Get as far out in the woods as you can go, mom. Because I don't want you to hear me screaming. Weep not for me. Weep for yourself, but don't, I don't want you to suffer for me. So please, mother. This is a son worried about his mother. And then a son who trusts in his father. As long as dad's here to hold me. As long as I have my father's presence and my father's strength. Then I will endure. And so he did. Are you seeing some parallels to what Jesus is going through? One other thing to say with the help of a little boy about this moment, because here is about our midway point of this week's lesson. Here, you might want to stop and take a break and come up for air and come back and watch for another hour. Here, we've seen everything leading up to Calvary. But from this point forward, it's, it's crucifixion all the way. And to see what happens on the cross and the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. That's what we'll spend the rest of our time on. But to transition from one to the other, may I tell you the story, a true story of a little boy. I heard this story from his father, who was a, in a, a leader within church education, worked with audiovisual kinds of things. And this was back when I was young, and the church was filming a video of the last week of the Savior's life. And there was a scene, this was at the LDS Motion Picture Studios in Provo, and they had, they had built Jerusalem before they had the Jerusalem set out in Goshen. And it was made to look like Pilate's palace and the judgment hall, you could call it. And the place, there's Pilate up on this kind of looking above or up above looking down on the people. The place is filled with multitudes. And this is right after Jesus, or in this case, the actor portraying Jesus had been scourged, or at least made to look like he had been, in as non-graphic as the church felt comfortable with, okay? Well, this father, thinking this would be fun for my little boy, my son, to come and, and see. I mean, to watch a movie in the making. This is like Hollywood in Utah, so come. And this little, this little boy was thrilled. But he was so young, it's that age where Fiction and fact kind of blend together, and sometimes something can look so real that it seems real to you. As far as this little boy was concerned, he stepped across place and it's back in time, and he was in ancient Jerusalem. The set was, I mean, the set was as real as it could, it could be made to seem. And the actor was, looked just like Jesus. And the people were all in period attire, all these extras that were packed in to cry, crucify him, crucify him, when the actor portraying Pilate was washing his hands of it all. Well, the father thought this was, oh, my son's going to eat this up. This is going to be amazing. Now, hopefully this is life-changing for him. And he recognizes this portrayal to help him view his death, as Jacob said. But then something happened that the father could not have predicted. They certainly didn't expect. In the heat of the moment, cameras rolling, and father and son behind the camera, kind of backstage, just to watch it all unfold. It was so real to this little boy. That was Jesus. And he looked hurt. He had a crown of thorns. He had a purple robe. Behold the man. And he was beholding. This is your king. And this was the little boy's king of kings. And the crowds were shouting at him, crying out to have him crucified, crucified. The same group that days before, less than a week, had been crying Hosanna at the triumphal entry, are now shouting, crucify him in front of the Roman guards. 
The little boy, it was too much for him. It was too real for him. And what did he do? He bolted out from behind the camera and ran right out in front of the actor playing Jesus. He wheeled around and faced the multitude, these angry extras with bloodthirst dripping from their mouths. And this little boy, summoning all of his courage, started shouting back at them, saying, leave him alone. He hasn't done anything wrong. It ruined the shot, obviously, but it made the moment. As these people realized, here's a little boy that just would do anything to defend Jesus. I want to be more like him. I don't want to betray him. I don't want to deny him. I don't want to appease his enemies by appearing less committed than I really am, less convinced, less converted. Oh no, I know. I know who the Savior is. And I want to come to his rescue, who always comes to mind. May we be willing to face the multitudes, brave the crowds, and come to Christ's defense. He has certainly come to ours.